In 1982, seven people took Tylenol to relieve their minor aches and pains. These seven people would ultimately succumb to the medicine. Not because of the Tylenol itself, but because the medicine was laced with potassium cyanide. Why would someone commit such a seemingly random and horrific act? For what reason other than being pure evil could someone do this? It's a question that has failed to be answered to this day, and these murders are still unsolved nearly four decades later. Johnson & Johnson, the maker of the Tylenol branded tablets, is still offering a reward of $100,000 to anyone who can help solve this heinous crime, making the lack of resolution even more surprising. The parents of 12-year-old Mary Kellerman certainly didn't wake up that horrible morning in September 1982 expecting their beautiful daughter to die from taking a painkiller. Just hours after the young girl was given Tylenol as a way of fighting a cold, she succumbed to the pill's lethal lacing of poison. That same morning, postal worker Adam Janus was rushed to the emergency room and also ultimately succumbed to the poison. The death of a loved one is of course one of the worst things one can go through and Janice's brother and wife were certainly in the heavy stages of mourning after hearing about the death of the brother and husband to the two. The stress caused from the tragic event gave them both headaches, so the two of them took an extra strength Tylenol to ease the pain. Little did the mourners know, however, that they too would also die on this day. Over the next few days, the death toll in Chicago, Illinois continued to grow, healthy people suddenly dying with no apparent rhyme or reason. The only connection that the authorities could find among the murdered was the fact that they all had taken extra strength Tylenol. This discovery prompted the testing of the Tylenol pills in the possession of these families. The test came back showing a horrifying discovery. Each capsule was laced with enough potassium cyanide to provide thousands of fatal doses. The authorities were absolutely baffled by this discovery. After scrambling to find a common production line or drugstore as the culprit of this disaster, it was discovered that the capsules were produced in multiple plants and sold at drugstores all around Chicago. This seemingly proved that someone was tampering with these medicines on store shelves. Take this in for a moment. Someone was sinister enough to go to multiple drugstores around the Chicago area and physically open these Tylenol bottles, take apart the capsules and replace the painkiller with one of the most poisonous substances possible. As you can imagine, this news sent shockwaves around the United States. Uh, we've been receiving calls uh, about once every 15 seconds. At the Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's, we only have three poison lines, and they're lit up constantly ever since yesterday morning. Stores scrambled to remove every single Tylenol box and bottle from their shelves. Those who had recently taken Tylenol before hearing this news of the poisonings were absolutely terrified, calling hospitals and poison control hotlines during their panic attack. The police of Chicago rushed to the streets of the city blaring loudspeakers from their cars, warning everyone possible that they should dispose of any Tylenol products in their possession. The maker of Tylenol, Johnson & Johnson, was also devastated. They spent millions of dollars to get all their pills out of the stores, not to mention the brand damage that this caused to the company. At one point they considered renaming Tylenol, but they offered instead to keep the name and implement heavier safety measures. The task was taunting, but the company took this PR nightmare seriously, offering to replace all purchased capsules. Once the investigation began, a man by the name of James William Lewis started sending letters to Johnson & Johnson claiming that he was the one who tampered with the capsules and demanded one million from the company to stop. The search for Tylenol suspect James Lewis zeroes in on New York City, where authorities say Lewis and his wife were spotted less than a week ago. However, since he and his wife lived in New York at the time of the murders, and he had absolutely no known ties to Chicago, police didn't see enough credible evidence to prove Lewis was the culprit. Lewis was arrested, however, and charged with extortion and served 13 years in prison. To this day, the police have yet to find a credible suspect. Yesterday, FBI agents searched Lewis's Cambridge, Massachusetts home and released this statement. Given the many recent advances in forensic technology, it was only natural that a second look be taken at the case and recovered evidence. Former firefighter Chuck Kramer responded to the death of the first victim and is still hoping for an arrest. Uh, whoever it is, if, if somehow they catch the person responsible for that, I think it would be fantastic. In 2009, 25 years after the original incident, 
police received new tips and once again reviewed the evidence. They even searched the home of James William Lewis and took a DNA sample for analysis to no avail. One Johnson & Johnson employee by the name of Scott Bartz wrote a book entitled The Tylenol Mafia, Marketing, Murder and Johnson & Johnson, in which he claims that the real culprit was a Johnson & Johnson employee in either the repackaging or the distribution channel. He writes, not one bit of evidence ever supported the store shelf theory, except for the only fact that people bought Tylenol and they died. Of course, this theory has never been proven either. Interestingly, the FBI requested DNA samples from Ted Kaczynski, who infamously terrorized the area of the country a few years before. He denied any involvement, thus leaving the investigation with nothing. This is one of the most famous unsolved cases in American history, and as time continues to pass, it's looking less and less like it will ever be solved. If anything positive can be taken away from the incident, it's that the drug makers were forced to stop manufacturing capsules and switched over to tamper-proof packaging and seals. This has led to a dramatic reduction of copycat killers, which saw a major spike after the Tylenol case broke to the public. So there you have it. No one knows who did this, no one knows why. And this, my outcasts, is why we at Insanity Collection use Motrin. So, what are your thoughts on this infamous crime? Do you think Lewis was truly involved? Or do you believe the employee's theory that this was done by someone inside of the distribution channel? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. We have so much more coming up for you all. Thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already and tap that bell icon before it taps you. Stay insane.